Good afternoon. It's good to see you all here. Let's uh, begin our afternoon with uh, another word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for everything that you've done for us, that all you've given to us, all you've created for us. Help us as we listen to the study this afternoon that we'll gain a greater understanding of uh, what it is that you have done for us and what it is that you can do in, it, in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm trying to advance. Maybe it help us if I turn it on. Yeah, that'll help. Evolutionist G.A. Kirkwood describes the general theory of evolution as the theory that all the living forms in the world have arisen from a single source, which itself came from an inorganic form. Uh, and then he continues, the evidence which supports this is not sufficiently strong to allow us to consider it as anything other than a working hypothesis. So whatever you call it, whether it's a theory or a hypothesis, um, whatever that might be, sometimes people say evolution is proven, evolution is a fact. Um, whatever you call it, we're counseled to examine it and test it to see if it's true. We see this in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. It says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. And of course, the assumption there is that we need to get to let go of to uh, discard or discount anything that isn't good, anything that isn't true. Sometimes it's helpful for us to examine the reasons why an idea was developed, the motivations behind that. Um, evolution is a theory universally accepted, not because it could be proven by logical, coherent evidence to be true, but because the only alternative, special creation, is clearly incredible. And incredible here, of course, means not credible, not believable. These are secular scientists speaking. Materialism in our culture is absolute. Um, we have this quote. Materialism is absolute for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. And even if all the data points to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. So you're basically, for those that hold to naturalism or materialism, they simply exclude from the realm of possibility the existence of a creator or even an intelligent designer. Um, materialism is the philosophical belief that matter is the only reality. And in this belief system, matter left to itself produced all things, including the human brain. This brain then invented the idea of the supernatural, of God, of eternal life, and so forth, rather than God inventing us. Another motivation for evolution, to explain apparent design without a designer. That was the key to Darwin's theory, not the idea of evolution or common descent itself, says Carl Leland. He also writes, Darwin knew, and virtually all the world's foremost science, uh, students of his idea know, that belief in his concept quite simply spells materialism with a capital M. The idea of no designer, no purpose, no guiding intelligence, no progressive plan, these are not afterthoughts to Darwin's evolution, but form the very core of it. But can we explain ourselves? Is there no purpose to life? Are we an accident? That's what we're teaching kids in public school today. They're just an accident. If we were an accident, would we even be qualified to explain our existence? As uh, Carl, uh, sorry, C.S. Lewis uh, writes, if the solar system was brought about by an accidental collision, 
Then the appearance of organic life on this planet was also an accident, and the whole evolution of man was an accident, too. I see no reason for believing that one accident should be able to give a correct account of all the other accidents. Um, the whole concept of science today is maintained on the faith that the universe operates in a way that is rational and predictable and that we can learn about and understand it. Science also depends purely by faith on the belief that the laws of nature are consistent and uniform, repeatable and consistent. There are different types of science. Science has its limits. Observational science deals with repeatable and observable processes. We can investigate those by the experimental method, trying things over and over, seeing what works, what doesn't. But historical science deals with origins and things that are not observable nor repeatable. And there, the only way we can be sure of what actually happened is to have a reliable eyewitness. If we can have several eyewitnesses, even better. But perhaps the biggest problem with evolution today that has developed since Darwin's time is the issue of information. As we spoke about this morning, we know from DNA that complex organisms require more complex DNA This chart has the number of millions of base pairs for different types of creatures, starting from the single cell creatures at the top, going on down, down the line to larger ones. And we know that the variations that we see in plant and animal life are caused by mutations, but we also have learned that mutations just damage existing information in the genes. In the DNA, they don't add information. Information only comes from intelligence. The only thing you get from random processes is random noise. You can figure that out every time you turn your radio on in between the stations. You can tell between the station and, and the randomness in between. Darwin actually predicted some ways in which his theory could be upended. One thing he said was, why is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? The missing links, they call them. Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this is the most obvious and serious objection which can be argued against this theory. He said that more than 150 years ago, and the missing links are still missing. We've found a lot of fossils since then. Um, he just assumed at that time that our knowledge of fossils was incomplete, and he assumed that eventually we would find the intermediate forms in the fossil record that would meet his theory, but we haven't found them. And the chances are, at this point in time, enough time has passed, there's not any chance now, I don't think, that we're going to find intermediate forms in the fossil record. He went on to write, The geological record is extremely imperfect, and this fact will to a large extent explain why we do not find intermediate varieties, connecting together all the extinct and existing forms of life by the finest graduated steps. He who rejects these views on the nature of the geological record will rightly reject my whole theory. So he's basically saying, if this doesn't work out, my whole theory is uh, falsified. It's not valid. And a lot of time has passed. We've got a lot more fossils we've discovered, but the intermediate transitional forms are still missing. Here's uh, from Stephen J. Gould talking about the state situation today. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. Yet Darwin was so wedded to gradualism that he wagered his entire theory on a denial of this little record. Let's read a little bit more from Stephen J. Gould. I regard the failure to find a clear vector of progress in life's history as the most puzzling fact 
of the fossil record. So here's a major evolutionist saying, we still don't have it. Dr. Colin Patterson was a senior, senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural Sciences, and he wrote a book that was simply titled Evolution. After publishing the book, a reader asked him why he had not included any pictures of transitional forms in his book about evolution, and he wrote back this. He said, I fully agree. I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. You suggest that an artist should be used to visualize, each, uh, vi visualize such transformations, but where would we get the information from? I could not honestly provide it. And if I were to leave it to artistic license, would that not mislead the reader? At least he's honest. At least he's honest. So many times you go to the Museum of Natural History and they'll have something there that looks half ape, half human. And the assumption by the little children and adults that go there is that that's an accurate representation of reality based on data. But it's just misleading the observer uh, because of artistic license. And he wasn't willing to do that. So I have to give him credit for that. Uh, he wanted, went on to say this. Yet, Gould, he's talking about the Stephen Jay Gould that we just quoted, the now deceased professor of paleontology from Harvard University, and the American Museum people are hard to contradict when they say there are no transitional fossils. You say that I should at least show a photo of the fossil from which each type of organism was derived. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil for which one could make a watertight argument. A second way that Darwin predicted that his theory might be falsified would be to prove that a feature could not possibly have evolved gradually over time. He wrote this, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can find no such case. Now that was his thought at the time. Now we can find cases, lots of cases. Michael Behe published this book, Darwin's Black Box, in the year 1996. I can say that's in the last century, and I can make it sound even more impressive to say that was in the last millennium. Actually, it's been quite a few years since 1996. He published his book, Darwin's Black Box, and basically the title comes from the fact that in Darwin's day, microscopes were, very, microscopes were very crude, and so the cell looked like just a blob. And you could make the mistake of thinking that it was simple, not knowing what was really inside it. Now we know a lot about the cell and how complex the cell is. But he published his book showing that numerous examples of complex systems, these are called irreducibly complex systems, um, They, there are many of these examples in the living cell. Um, he notes the example of a mousetrap as an irreducibly complex system. Basically, all the parts have to be there. You have to have the base, you have to have the spring, you have to have the hammer, you have to have the bar that holds the hammer in place, you have to have the trigger, you have to have some bait on the trigger. All of those pieces are in place. And if any one of those pieces is missing, the mousetrap cannot function. Uh, also, the mouse trap can't um, be developed gradually along uh, its path with any subset of the parts and still be functional. For example, you could have the base, but the only value of the base would be maybe it's a paperweight. So let's say that the hammer got added to that. Uh, it's still a paperweight. It's not, there's no advantage to it having the extra hammer on it. And then you add the spring, and then you add the holder bar, and then you add the... the uh, uh, catch and then you add the uh, bait. Along the way, you cannot come up with any sequence of steps where the subset of the mousetrap is functional at each stage, so it cannot evolve because it's irreducibly complex. It's, once it's together, it's got to have all those pieces. A subset of them cannot work. Uh, but one example that he gives, uh, and it's far more complex than a mousetrap, is the bacterial flagellum. The bacteria uses this flagellum 
uh, like a boat uses an outboard motor. And it powers it and propels it around inside of liquid that moves about. So the bacterial flagellum has a rotary motor and it has these features. It assembles itself, it repairs itself, because cells reproduce, right? Uh, builds itself. It has a water-cooled rotary engine. Um, it has a proton motive force drive system, so it's basically a little electric motor. It has forward and reverse gears. When I was growing up, we had a boat that had a forward gear and it had a reverse gear. It had neutral. So you had to basically turn off the ignition to shift to the back. This thing doesn't have to turn off at all. It operates at up to 100,000 RPM. That's a lot faster than our engines operate today. 100,000 RPM for this little flagellum. And it can reverse direction within one quarter of a turn. That's pretty fast. It has a hardwired signal transduction system with short-term memory. Behe looked at things like this and he basically concluded, although he is an evolutionist, he believes that man and uh, chimpanzees descended from a common ancestor, the ape. But Behe does not believe that there is any way that you can explain the origin of the living cell because it has so many examples of these irreducibly complex systems. He believes that it is impossible for it to have evolved. If you look at something like this flagellum, look at all the different pieces that are required. There's something like 40 different uh, protein structures that are required. Um, maybe it could be functional, some people claim, with as little as six. But that's still a lot of pieces that have to be in place for it to have some sort of useful function. And without some sort of useful function, then evolution and natural selection would have no reason to keep it, no reason to continue developing it. And since Behe's book was published way back in 1996, although there are a lot of people that have tried, no one has been able to successfully refute his findings. The enormous amounts of information found within any cell, within any cell, and the increasing amounts of information in the cell that are needed as the complexity of the organism increases, and the complex mechanisms within the cell, all of which must exist at once for the cell to function, means that the complexity of the cell can no longer rationally be attributed to just the mutation and natural selection process. Information can't be created by random processes. They can only be created by intelligence. So in other words, there's no way that the origin of the cell can be explained by a process of evolution. And this impossibility has become more and more clear over time. It's even given rise to a complete new movement known as the intelligent design movement. Now, the intelligent design movement believes the evidence is strong that life had to originate with some sort of intelligence, with some sort of designer. Now, they don't necessarily propose the God of the Bible as that intelligent designer. Uh, some people suggest that life was placed here by aliens. Of course, then you have to explain where did the aliens come from. Michael Behe estimates that at this point in time, about one-third of the academics in the field of biology now believe that evolution cannot possibly explain the origin of the living cell. And that's a lot. He says that scientists often circle the wagons and publicly support evolution because of fear. They don't want the public to know how much controversy there is within the scientific community that is studying biology, and fear because they feel that science is starting to point in the direction of something like the God in the Bible. People in Darwin's day, when you think about it, didn't know anything about the field of genetics, much less DNA. Genetics didn't exist as a science until Gregor Mendel read his first paper in the year 1865. And Darwin admits that they didn't know how this worked. He wrote, our ignorance of the laws of variation is profound. Not in one case out of a hundred can we pretend to assign any reason why this or that part differs more or less from the same part in the parents. But whenever we have the means of instituting a comparison, the same laws appear to have acted in producing the lesser differences between varieties of the same species and the greater differences between species of the same genus. So he admitted that they didn't know much about. Uh, now, evolutionary theory recognizes mutations cause the variations, and they call that uh, neo-evolution, neo-evolutionary theory. 
In the 150 years since Darwin's work, we have made profound advances in our knowledge of the mechanics of inheritance. Rather than help Darwin's case, they have effectively falsified it. For example, how could numerous successive slight modifications lead to the origin of male and female, both of which are required for reproduction for most organisms? What if you had a female that developed by evolution, but then the male didn't come along for several million years later? That would just spoil the whole thing. They had to be there present in the same time. There are other challenges which have developed to evolution over time. One is the Big Bang. In Darwin's time, uniformitarians believed that time was infinite, and therefore, the universe was both infinitely old and would last for an infinite amount of time. And this made it easier to believe in naturalism and evolution because with infinite time, they figured anything could happen, given enough time. But large amounts of time are required, not only required, are essential for evolution to be true. The evolutionary model depends on time. They can't give up the millions of years because they need the millions and billions of years uh, as time to de develop life in their theory. So when <coughs> the Big Bang Theory came along, first appearing in a paper by Georges Lemaitre in 1931 and becoming popular with the discovery of cosmic background radiation in the year 1965, that cut the amount of time available drastically from infinity to, uh, they now believe that the uh, universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Now, 13.8 billion sounds like a big number, but that's a lot less than infinity. And because it's a lot less than infinity, the probabilities of evolution actually be, being feasible go down dramatically with that uh, change in thinking. And secular scientists believe our solar system was formed about 4.5 billion years ago, which is even shorter than the 13.8 billion. So life on this Earth had to have been developed under their theory within that shorter period. And suddenly, without infinite time available for evolution to work, um, it's a lot harder to prove that it can happen. <coughs> now, as we'll see in the next session, after we have a short break, scientific evidence is appearing that shows that the age of the Earth is even very much shorter than these time frames. Uh, I want to close with a quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 116. Those who take the written word as their counselor will find in science an aid to understand God. So if we start with the Bible, which contains God's eyewitness account of creation, it contains human eyewitness records of the global flood, participants in the flood, uh, pass that along. And if we use these two as the basis for our assumptions about the world, then we're going to be at a much better starting point for any of our scientific investigations. Let's close with a quick word of prayer, and then we'll take a break and come back for our fourth session where we will talk about scientific evidence for a recent creation. Father in heaven, thank you for the advances of science that are showing us more and more that you were right all along in your word. Father, thank you for the, your mercy in allowing us to learn more about our world, and as we learn more about the world, we learn more about the truth about nature and the truth about your word. We thank you for that, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.